Welcome to Sellers Conference, Day 1, Discussion 1. Johannes.
You know, you gave away the fact you were very close to the How are you? Oh, no, you haven't given away the name of me. Well, you can make a Sometimes this works really well. <laughs> um, if you, um, if all of this is news to you, then um, the following might be news too. 
Um, the way to get the papers is from the website of the conference. It's listed on the brochure. Um, also easy to find through the philosophy department website here. Um, and the password for the access to the papers is Jones. J O N S lowercase j. So um, that will get you both to the papers as well as to the seller's documents that are presupposed in some of the papers if, if those are things you don't know as well. So if you want to uh, uh, go and prepare, uh, um, you can slide out of the room. Just uh, start reading for the later session. Um, our, our, um, our first speaker, as well as um, co-organizer of the conference, is Johannes Hogg who's professor of philosophy at uh, the University of Potsdam, somebody who works um, both in German idealism, especially Kant, um, um, both the practical and the theoretical philosophy, indeed the third critique, and beyond, into Fichte and Hegel, as well as somebody who works on uh, contemporary analytic, philosophy of mind, metaphysics, and um, especially interested in sellers. Um, um, so he's a perfect, perfect person for this conference, perhaps not surprising, since he's also one of its co-organizers. <laughs> We're the people who embody the possibility of uh, bringing sellers and Kant together um, in a single soul. Um, and, um, and his paper is also a nice one for us to start with, because it's both a Kant and a seller's paper at the same time. And the title is Transcendent. Really. Okay. Well, thank you, Jim. And... Um I um, will um, start right away with um, telling you rather quickly about um, the reasons why I choose this paper instead of some other stuff I did more recently on, on Kant, for instance, and less connected to Stella. Um, Stella. So um, the first reason is that while I'm concentrating on Stella's, um, the paper addresses systematic, quest systematic questions of relevance both to Kant and Stellas. The second reason is that it presents a few of Stellas' work, or at least the central parts of his work, that I take to be certainly novel and presumably very controversial. Rather selfishly, I wanted to take the opportunity to hear what a room full of experts on Stellarian thought has to say about it. The third reason is the thematizing sense impressions, scientific realism, perception in general, and transcendental methodology in Pellas. It touches upon many of the topics that I felt did steer, steer, steer the best discussions in the first installment of this workshop one year ago. Well, maybe not the best discussions, but certainly the most lively discussions. <laughs> <laughs> the paper is, as it were, complementary to the paper I gave last time on some Kantian themes in the Fritzellers, and consequentially rounds up the exposition of what I take to be the core of the last Vian Kantian. Unlike the last paper, this one is unpublished and in, rather, in parts rather sketchy. I have to apologize for some loose ends and rough transitions in the text that certainly did not contribute to its readability. In large part, that is due to the fact that the genesis of the paper reaches back over a long period of time and had later on repeatedly to be supplemented and partially changed as my views on the subject evolved. The central argument of the paper, that is, the argument for the transcendental philosophical motivation of scientific realism, has been on my mind for a very long time. The first version of it constituted part of my book on Erfahrung und Gegenstand, printed in 2007, but written some two years earlier. This core argument since then has not essentially changed. What has changed, however, and quite dramatically, is my understanding of the views of John McDowell. Back then, McDowell's views constituted the background against which I developed my own reading, often this critical intent. While I stick to parts of my criticism, some of this criticism was based on simple and some on not so simple misunderstanding. And some of the criticism would be misguided today since it turns out not only my views have changed, but so has McDowell's reading of Sellers. Back then it was the Woodbridge Lectures that gave the most recent and developed account of McDowell's reading of Sellers, since then many more papers on the subject have appeared, perhaps most notably the text on sensory consciousness and consciousness in Kant and Sellers. Consequently, consequently, I felt the need to adjust parts of my own discussion of both Sellers and McDowell in the paper. I hope those adjustments, while probably not furthering the readability of the paper, at least contributed to its overall truth. So, we can now. Who would like to break the ice? Well, I'll start with something. Um, 
I enjoyed the paper and I agree with a lot of it. And I, uh, so I'm wondering about the uh, grounds for the scientific realism. There is the, um, so what you're focusing on is the perceived object and the need to relocate um, the sensor, sensible qualities. And I agreed with the way you spelled out that. Um, one of the things is when Jones, um, in the myth of Jones, uh, posits states of, so we see a red apple or we hallucinate a red apple, we have a, a state of sensing in the red apple manner. <clears throat> in the manifest image, that remains unclear, right? There's colored, uh, objects are still colored. That's the tricky bit, right? And so what he says is then it's just kind of unclear what the status of the... You, you posit these states. You're, you, you're in a state of sensing red apple-wise, but the apple's still red. So this relates to a second question, which is another ground for the scientific realism is... What about this question? Well, so keep that in mind that okay. there's, there's sort of... <laughs> as far as the manifest <laughs> image... Background information. As far as the manifest image... Well, what am I... Okay, we can agree on that. Okay. <laughs> well, good. So then the other thing is this, this passage um, from uh, Science and Metaphysics where he says, um, you know, if we could hold that concepts of microphysical objects were merely instrumental... Then he says, uh, our picture of the world would be Aristotelian, and it would be in Strassonian terms, and it would be perfectly adequate, and we would picture the world in that way. Mm -hmm. So this is just leading me to think that the real prime motivation for the scientific realism, per se, is the stuff about, you know, the manifest account of physical objects, gases, and so on. You know, science gives us, happens to give us better explanatory pictures. And so you replace the framework of the manifest image. Um, so if it weren't for that, if it weren't that we happen to get better microphysical theories in his opinion and his view of Kuhnian replacement, um, it would just turn out that the perception of the, the we, we weren't trans we don't have to be transcendental ideas another point. We don't have to be transcendental idealists about ordinary colored objects. If it happened to be the case that yeah that these other considerations about science didn't obtain. So that was the question. Okay, so, I mean, of course, that is probably more or less a good sketch of the view I'm opposing. Um, I, um, I see where this comes from, and I, I think there are, as I acknowledge in this paper, I guess, um, uh, there are, of course, remarks of Stellas which um, show that um, for him this... Um, Constitutes, constitutes good prima facie reasons to, to, to go for scientific realism instead of the instrumentalist view of, of um, the world of science. And um, especially in, in the papers that really concentrate on the issue of scientific realism, I mean, both, well, probably more the um, scientific realism or ironic realism paper, probably less so the, the scientific realism tenable paper. Um, I, I, probably will evoke that later on again um, just to keep that in mind that there seems to be a, um, a slight uh, adjustment in views or, but um, what I really think is that and what I really take serious and want to take serious are the remarks for Stellas insists that if mental states are the real place of color and shape in the scheme of things then, and this is nearly a quote um, um, nothing not a mental state could be colored or um, have shape so um, and in taking serious that I don't see how even in the manifest image this could be sort of a stable view of the way things are I would um, think that um, this is a, a, a part of what makes the manifest film image ultimately an image that is to be transcended and which we cannot. Um, and, and, and just a, a short remark on what I started with this 
uh, difference in the, in, the, in the last papers. In this scientific reason tenable, he has those two parts. He has the first part, of course, on, um, on um, um, we, we are scientific reason, right? No, that's what of course. And the second part, the Kornman. And he, um, not only, this is not a mere accident because those two have sort of this replies to those two, but in the Hans Hasen piece, he um, hints at the Kornman paper, uh, piece of the paper, and says, okay, some of the real reasons I'm going to give for scientific reasons will be found there <coughs> in the part and where I discuss <coughs> sorry, perception and, and, and stuff connected with, with those questions. Yeah. So um, I take it that this really is what. Uh, at least for him an important motivation. Yeah. Whether this motivation is connected in a way I suggested with the transcendental reasoning in Kant's transcendental idealism is yet another question of course. I'm, I'm, I think that is something, something that would have to be showed further I thought was, uh, was part of what I wanted to show in this paper. Yeah, I, well, go ahead Michael. I mean I agree there's the two two ways in which the manifest image breaks down from within, and you're right, you're focusing on the one of them. Yeah. And he, d he does sort of say it's the imp and I agree that it's, it's incoherent, this position in Fellers' things, where you've got states of sensing in vertical and non-vertical, yeah. that he uh, and yet you're attributing color to the object. But he says it's the impact of the scientific picture that then brings that incoherent and moves you. So I agree that but, but I mean, this is a mere ontological question. I mean, uh, can properties of states be properties of objects in physical space? And he seems to deny this purely sort of a priori question. And um, that for me, that does the trick. Even if he would have found out nothing about um, a better picture, um, and so this is, uh, on my view, this is sort of, of, of uh, changing. Uh, of, of messing up the, the direction of, of explanation. Of course, we have to find out an alternative explanation, a scientific explanation, that is, in this case, for what's going on out there. But um, this is something that comes later and is motivated, in my view, or my reading, and quite Thanks. like this. Sure. Um, I think this is following on where, where Jim is. Um, Jim's agreeing with you that there are these two ways uh, into... Uh, scientific realism, and I need to be persuaded that there is the one that you're yeah. mm -hmm. uh, talking about. Um, uh, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, everything turns on the claim that um, it's part of the manifest image, anyway, as fixed up, uh, that uh, sensibilia can only be uh, properties of states of perceiving subjects. Yeah. May I? May I? Isn't that it? I mean, because that's the that's the germ of the Everything collapse of the manifest in, image. In, in, from but in the manifest image, um, um, those qualities, uh, sensibilia, are properties of state. Uh, I mean, right. they are interesting, yeah. uh, but, but only in, in a second understanding. They are at mm -hmm. first properties of right. the objects of that there, but then there's a the development within the. But the, 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 that, that development is within the manifest image is what's not clear to me um, the, the question that might just be terminological or textual or something about what the sense impression inference is you use that label which I think he uses in science and metaphysics uh, and it's a label for something that he was already talking about in um, yeah, EPM um, um, I mean when the thing called that first shows up uh, the conclusion isn't something um, about which that claim is made, right? Um, um, uh, um, it, it's something like uh, whenever there is a perception or maybe ostensible perception uh, whose ostensible object is a sensibile, uh, then there is a sense impression. Um, there's nothing in there yet right, to, 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 to push us to say and furthermore, uh, the sensibilia are exclusively. Um, and, and that seems to me to show up in, in the, um, the late crazy stuff, the you know, chorus mm -hmm. lectures, and, and no longer under the head of um, uh, uh, the manifest image trying its best to fix itself up. Right? It's mm -hmm. not at all clear to me that that 
that move isn't a, a sort of tiptoeing. I mean, from by, by the lights of the sellers who cares about the distinction between the images, a kind of tiptoeing into uh, the uh, scientific. Image. So a, a lot matters for you. Absolutely. Um, in the claim that it, it, we're still in the manifest image when we make this okay. right, peculiar um, a peculiar claim that the sensibility of belong really belong, primarily belong as properties of states of the perceiving subject um, it is, um, and that Jim's line I think is going to be um, you know, why should anyone believe that right. except on the basis of yeah, um, I mean, all that prior argument. All that uh, argument exactly. seems to get you is that there's some state you're in mm-hmm. in common between the, it appears to be, right. that the, yeah. you know, all of those. And as far it as doesn't that follow goes, that that's the real the red. Sensibilia is still the argument for that being really red mm-hmm. is, is, as you say, all the, mm-hmm. all the stuff about how this fits with the scientific image, which I is have the, to, the I wacky have sellers, but, mm-hmm. but even if it's whatever it's wacky or not, it's, it's <laughs> how it fits with the scientific image. That's what makes it be the real red. There's, I don't see any argument in the mere myth of... Uh, uh, Jones, mm-hmm. that, that, that could remotely right. convince you that that's what really red is. No, we uh, mm-hmm. have to, to distinguish between what is really there in the myth of Jones and um, what um, follows from what Jones did there, because not everything that is in the myth of Jones, uh, every, mm-hmm. um, everything that follows from it is outlined in EPM, mm-hmm. but that's simply not important for what he did in EPM. Sure. That wasn't his interest. And um, so, um, for instance, some of the stuff that mythically followed um, doesn't really follow from what Jones did. I mean, that's sure. the very last part of book. Mm-hmm. This is a case in point about Jones turning to sense data to explain that. And he doesn't need it to have, but this is a rhetoric question. So I suppose mm-hmm. that no, it need, needn't have to be that because we have an alternative. And um, um, this alternative is, um, I mean, if, as a point of, of Sarah's exegesis, I, I don't think that this. Um, it shows up only in the late the stuff, which I do not think is crazy. <laughs> and by the way, I'm just for the Sorry. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> parenthetical insult. I mean, not just for the... <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, I, I think that there's a, 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 a strong continuity in, 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 in this... Uh, in his talking about this. It can be seen, for instance, um, in, in, in the at least in the work on perception in, in the, in the um, 60s, in phenomenalism, you, you have similar lines of reasoning in, in of, certainly, okay, that's from the early 70s in structure of knowledge and, and similar papers. Um, he's, he's, he's not, um, I think for him, this, um, this ontological point about um, something being a state of person and having certain properties um, and those properties really being there, I mean, there's no way of denying that. Um, and then they're not, then that this is not possible, then it would then not be possible to be properties um, um, of this very kind outside, as we're in the physical objects. Um, it's there from, from, I guess, very early on. But, but this is something uh, that would have to be argued exegetically. I, I, I don't want to, to, to make too much but of it. From there, very early on, you mean as part of one's thinking qua mm-hmm. inhabitant of the uh, manifesto. Yeah, and, and the, the various notions of early on. Very, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, in, 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 in both ways. The, the thing is, um, in what you have in the, in the, in the manifest images, I mean, this, this is, is part of, of, of the question whether the, the introduction of sense impressions in the myth of Jones is part of the manifest image, and if you take it to be that, then um, there is what I, for Stellas, what I, I uh, um, try to line out as, as, as pressure from within, as it were. Um, but everyone agrees with that, right? Yeah. Is there anyone who no, there's pressure from within is resulting from. Uh, from there not being no, no, John yeah. cannot agree with that because and, and neither did Mark but because um, they what they argued was um, um, there is no pressure at all to to say that um, those physical objects do not have those properties anymore. Well, well, let me give you. And I think that for Stellas that is clear. <laughs> let me give you another. Take yeah, and I think that you agree yeah. ultimately. Well, I would really, I would like to to hear Jim about that because um, and the, 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 what the John just claimed was that there was a change here in the late crazy yeah. stuff, the ostensible seeings.
turn into something that discredits physical properties. But, but I agree, and I think John would agree that the first move of the... Mm -hmm. You're right about the... Uh, when you posit sense impressions, there's states of manifest perceivers. Yeah. Yeah. So it takes mm -hmm. place in the manifest perceivers. Sure. It's just yeah. the move from... The move Sensibilia are exclusively in those mental. states, properties right. of those states. Absolutely. When you yeah. first do it in the manifest, when you first do it in the manifest image, yeah. you've got colored objects Absolutely. and you've got veridical and non-veridical perception. You don't quite quite know. You've got sense impressions, but you're not a radical mm -hmm. indirect realist right. or anything in the in the. Uh, right, sense manifest. impressions come in as mm. needed to explain, make sense of, yeah. Yeah. ostensible perceivings of sensibilia. <laughs> Some of which are perceivings of sensibilia. At any rate, so far as any of that goes, um, I agree. Uh, that you, it's still you have you have um, the sense impression inferences starting from, um, but seems to me to be the conclusion of Sellers' sense impression inference. Um, when someone ostensibly sees a pink cube, something in some way cubic and pink is in yeah. some way. That's present to this point. person, not conceptually, not as believed in. That's the conclusion. Point. That's that's right. that's a specification. <coughs> that's not the conclusion of the sense of inference. That's a phenomenological mm -hmm. fact. He starts right. with. Have you insist on that? But it's a phenomenological fact that coincides with. Well, uh, that, that, uh, that's the point of uh, that would have to be discussed. But but what I'm not sure that, that it, it, it needs to coincide in that way. I mean he. He doesn't seem to... Phenomenological confirmation of the sense impression. It is for no, I think it's... I'm an ally. So, so yeah. Michael, yeah. Bill, Mark, mm. Mark on that, just so we have some order. Okay. People are order? <laughs> <laughs> so, I think what something that bothers me here oh. is this talk about the clash of the images at all. Because sometimes when you read Sellers, you, strong, you get the strong impression that there's a clash between what we might call common sense and what we might call theoretical science. But that can't be quite right, because what the manifest image has to... I mean, most people don't have a metaphysical idea in their head. What the manifest image is, is some kind of explicitation or articulation of the implicit metaphysics of common sense. That's what it has to be. Um, but then there's a quite, uh, and you can be right or wrong about it, according to Sellers. So the question might come up whether he's right about it, um, and whether it's committed to all the things he thinks it is. And if you've got to engineer a clash, then you need some stability of meaning on both sides of the uh, of the fence, as it were. So let me just give you a series of examples, and you can react oh, to them. So, oh, so I'll start off with the Charles Travis case. Um, we, 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 never mind, John. Okay, so we're, out, we're, at, we're at the lake. It's a nice sunny morning, cloudless sky. And I say, how blue the lake is today. And you dip a jam jar into the lake and get some cloudy, faintly brackish looking water. And you say, no, it isn't. Now, the natural inference is that is you misunderstood me when I said how blue the lake is there was a contextual understanding that made that method of verification not relevant ok so when Jacob says my brother Esau is an hairy man but I am a smooth man someone says no you're not in fact your skin is dimpled all over the place and more than that it's full of tiny holes that you sweat through they're called pores <laughs> that seems an artificial contribution too ok let's get a bit closer to phone I say the table is solid no it isn't it's mostly empty space says Sir Arthur Eddington now when you think of these examples, you start to think that maybe the clash between common sense and theoretical science, even non-instrumentally interpreted, is not quite so readily engineered. And you might think it for good Salazian reasons. Sellers is a holistic inferentialist about meaning. So questions are going to come up when we're going into sense data and inferences and so forth what the inferential engagements of ordinary color talk actually are and whether those judgments are ever meant 
unless subject to heavy <coughs> medical <coughs> massaging in a way that's going to generate the sort of clash that Sellers wants. Now, I'm not making this in a polemical way. I just think it's harder to generate these clashes than, 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 than Sellers thinks. It's somehow, the minute you're told the world is all particles swarming around, possibly non-locally, and all the rest of it, um, you know, oh my goodness, what happened to the table? What, what, what happened to the redness of the, of the apple? It's not going to be a straight contradiction unless you have some views about the logic of ordinary color language. You know, it, it's not, it, it's just not a one step inference, I don't think. Michael, did, did I talk about the clash of the images? Well, you no, certainly, well, you certainly, when well, you're yeah, talking about yeah, transcendental, yeah, you do actually, when you would look, imply it. transcendental well, realism that, is at the heart of it. Though. I, no, it isn't. That wasn't exactly, that was exactly not my picture. My picture was that the manifest image within itself does generate a pariahs that lead us to introduce some further level of explanation, some further level of, uh, some further frame of reference. So there's no talk about a clash here. And I didn't pu push this, I mean, set up occasionally talks about a clash of the images and uh, says, okay, we need to okay. make this disappear. So I'm, I'm completely with you. On so that. I was taking I, I off on the transcendental so realism, though, because the consequence he draws from it is that the ordinary world is a phenomenal world. That is the conclusion. That is it's a world of appearance. It still is not a clash between images, at least not in a... It is, it is a, a new uh, okay. interpretation of the image we already had and had all along. So ordinary color, talk is, not <coughs> ordinary color talk is not straightforwardly true. That he does say. Yeah, I know. At yeah. best, there's a kind of gerrymandered successor to yeah. ordinary color talk that will speak at the time of con conceptual structure CSP or language CSP. Yeah. But I don't think it's so easy to say that ordinary color talk is not strictly true unless you have a view about the inferential engagements of ordinary that color is talk. That's a very good point, but it wasn't the point I was making because I didn't defend Sellers on that point. Oh. I just simply tried to read him on that point. And, um, well, I thought I was defending John that you need a bit of this scientific manifest no, energy before want to you get the apparatus. No, I don't want to out of that. It's just that I, it, it, the purpose of this paper was not to defend the views there, oh. but to or show a way in which Sellers might have convinced himself I, I, I share parts of it and parts of it I don't share yeah. so I mean that, that is what I, I, what I but just to keep track of the debate I mean the common topic here is um, kind of understanding what motivates Sellers to the conclusion ordinary color talk is not true but as I understand it um, the difference is between the reading of Sellers you're offering and the reading of Sellers that Johannes was offering that people were then yeah. raising a different objection yeah. to was that um, one way you could think it's not true is you have a clash between the images and then in resolving the clash the manifest image loses out. <laughs> the That's right. is truth claim. The other way of looking at it seems to be Johannes is, is that what causes the trouble is not initially a clash between two self-standingly stable images but that the manifest image itself on Johannes's reading itself contains aporia that get it into trouble yeah. Yeah. so the instability if you will the contradiction is already in the manifest image and that's what leads the scientific image and then the questions that John Jim and Mark were raising as I understood it was is that right about yeah. Sellers' view of the manifest image yeah. that it's internally contains this operator yeah, right. yeah. as opposed to and then they would come around to your reading but only in a second step yeah but I, the I, trouble comes from a kind of reflection beyond the manifest image which is not itself internal to the manifest that's, image that's yeah. what I thought I was defending that, that without some prior view of the logic of quote the manifest image or better still common sense color talk it's not so easy to get the aporia that What's doing it under the surface is always some worry that is rooted in the, and I think that's what Jim thinks too, it's rooted in the scientific. Right. And, but then what Johannes is going to say in the first round of discussion is, I deny that. I know he does. Okay. <laughs> okay. And so then the question is, um, the, the question we had before, which I don't want to lose because I think that's what people wanted to yeah. chime in on, is this Sellers, is this right about Sellers' account of the manifest image, which becomes partly a question about how to understand what makes the manifest image an image in its own right. And that's what your paper was about, actually, at our last workshop. I think we should let you have the word. Well, th yeah, that's probably not what I'm going to ask about. Um, <laughs> well, you're, uh, well, you're the expert on this. <laughs> um, I guess 
as, as I read it, I mean, the people, some people seem to be, I think I heard this, this, assuming that Sellers believes that in the manifest image it turns out to be wrong to think that objects are colored. But that's, but that's just wrong. I mean, he says that... I didn't say that in the manifest image it is, turns out that it is wrong. Yeah, so it right. cannot yeah, be part yeah. of the manifest image. What I said is, in the manifest image, the claim is both the object outside and Stan's impressions are Right. No, I, I'm and not accusing you. I thought Mark was course, yeah, uh, uh, hinting at something like that, 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 that some people were... Yeah. But as, as, as I read it, I mean, not the manifest image, not the manifest image. Sellers does recognize that, you can call it a phenomenological principle, you can call it the sense impression, that when, when you either see or ostensibly see something red and triangular, then somehow s- something somehow red and rectangular in physical space is present to you other than it's believed in. And, but that's a constraint that, that operates just as much on the manifest image. And, and you get, for instance, uh, an Aristotelian story about, well, that there are that red has a being for sense and uh, the being in the object itself. And so you get red has sort of a two, uh, two sides to it. Um, but, but what I take him, the, the sort of the aporia that I think Johannes is pointing to is the idea that, well, that, that principle... Uh, somehow, something somehow red and rectangular is present to me. Uh, is, is sort of a challenge, and he thinks that in the long run the Aristotelian answer doesn't quite satisfy. But but the idea that re- things aren't really red that only started popping up with the rise of the new sciences, and so that particular way of answering or some some particular answers to how it is that that red shows up in both physical objects which the manifest image clearly believes in and in the our abilities to sense them um, which is also somehow committed to the idea that there's a clash here only starts to show up when the I mean there, there's always a problem for the manifest image in, in trying to coordinate those two the particular way the story has gone, in fact, does depend upon the contingencies of the rise of the new science, which tells us that, well, we don't need to talk about rednesses and sense impressions because, because physics doesn't talk about that stuff. So, okay. So, okay, just, just to try to, to probably express myself clearer, hopefully. Um, I do not need to deny that this was what in the point of fact happened in the manifest image with the rise of science and so on and so on. This is a historical point, and I take it as it is not what Sellers was interested in. What I take, if he was interested in, is philosophy, and there we have some reasons which do simply not have anything to do with how things, in fact, develop, or only very superficially. At least there are no easy conclusions from one to the other. And um, I I, um, think that, I mean, one, one could... Uh, and I'm open to, to, to argue that uh, this implication of the sense of pressure inference is already there very early. But um, even if it is not there very early, it is certainly there in the late stuff, in the late crazy stuff, maybe. Stuff maybe. And um, there it is tied to this, um, what I tried to phrase as a ontological question. Mm-hmm. And that I think it's very hard to deny that given the evidence of the text. Of course, you can say, well, that's crazy. He somehow lost, lost it or something like that. But that still doesn't seem to be the point. So, no, no just, just so that, that is the important part for me. Um, and, and not something else. I, I see that John is able to do it. Forget crazy. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think there's a very nice question you're, you're focusing, and Bill helped to focus it. Um, so, um, uh, up to a point, right, the manifest image gives us that uh, E.G. Red has both presence for sense, which is not conceptual or anything, mm-hmm. and uh, presence for thought-informed perception. Uh, and um, Johannes is pointing to the thought, we can't live with that. Uh, we need more explanation of that. Uh, as a I like the latter for you. They don't say we can't live with it, but, but we, we do I'm, I'm need just, more explanation. I'm sticking words on him. Okay. Um, there's a problem there's about sure. there's a problem about yeah. that, and the question is, is the problem about that internal mm-hmm. to the manifest image. image, or do you have to be already yes. thinking like a scientific realist to find that unsatisfactory? 
Uh, and the thought over here is, no, you don't. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, yes, you do. Right? <laughs> if, you, if you stay with the manifest image, that's fine. Presence, presence to sense and presence to uh, conceptually informed because perception. Can, um, can I, just to bring Bill That's fine. Yeah. Um, I thought Bill also added an interesting wrinkle into that mm -hmm. frame of discussion, just as you um, explicated just now, today. which is... Um, what should we make of Aristotelianism as a, um, mm -hmm. the Aristotelian view, mm -hmm. as itself an explication mm -hmm. of the, the manifest, manifest image? image. Um, yeah. it, the, mm -hmm. the Aristotelian view, at least in this feature that Bill is focusing on, feature is focused on just this issue, but it seems to satisfy itself with an account, you know, in which it no longer feels its face with an operia. So, mm -hmm. if... I understand your position. This is, this is, this is ultimately a question clarification um, I'm asking for. You have to say something like, Aristotelianism reflects inadequate reflection on the manifest image, qua, you know, a mode internal to the manifest image. The manifest image itself requires that we go beyond Aristotelianism in accounting for the manifest image. So we're getting a kind of I account. This doesn't, I think, settle anything. It just kind of yeah. clarifies a bit how much is built into one conception of the manifest image versus another. The manifest image is something to which we're, we have to ascribe. It's, mm -hmm. it's wrong, but it, we have to ascribe a fairly rich conception of something like, you know, adequate standards of reflecting on theorizing itself, mm -hmm. such that Aristotelian philosophy, which you know flourishes for centuries, winds up not living up to the adequate, the manifest image on conception of what it is to account for itself. Before we move beyond the manifest image, so I mean, I think part of what maybe there's a disagreement about is how much of a rich theoretical conception of what it is to have an adequate account of what the manifest image is committed to itself. Uh, uh, is a self account that belongs to the manifest image. Uh, uh, I, uh, I think I, I, much depends on how, how lame the concept of, of Aristotelianism is here. And, um, so, uh, in as far as, uh, in the way Salas used it, when he said, like, Aristotle is the philosopher of the manifest image and stuff like that, I, I, I was thinking I, 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 I was thinking I, I would probably agree, would have to agree. What, what I really, I mean, there, there is this, this question here, um, which, possibly, I'm, I'm not um, completely, um, well, it's really my fault that this is so much in focus, but uh, is this still part of the manifest image? When are we sort of starting to leave that, or what kind of reflection belongs still within the manifest image and which doesn't anymore? Um, <coughs> I, I really think that if you keep separated in the way that Bill just pointed out so nicely, the two ways of being of color, the being for sense and the being for thought, then what really changes and can change is only the being for thought of color, because that's where development might ensue. I mean, the being for sense is simply something that's fixed. I mean, that's an ontological category. So it's, it's something we, we have. Yeah. Okay. And um, <coughs> so... What, what really happens is that um, our thinking about color is subjected itself to scrutiny and um, is, has to be open to you know, well, sort of transcendental methodologi methodological reflection. So what is the place of color in the scheme of scheme of things? So that belongs, and that this question and, and the what what is used from it is part of our concept of color. And so this conception is developing, and in so developing, it forces our, uh, on my view, it forces, or my interpretation of status view, it forces us to ultimately leave what we call the manifest image in its simple Aristotelian form. We still can stick to Aristotelianism as far as phenomenal reality is concerned. I mean, this way, too, he seems to be quite Kantian. But um, that's, a, that's a different question. And he's not purely Kantian there, I have to. Which, which, um, so we have Mark and Matt. Okay, so, so Alice, first of all, like, take, take your point. 
the germs of this are in the earlier papers. That's absolutely right. Um, so it's not just at the though I think it gets its fullest <coughs> development yeah. at the latest stuff. Um, and I'm not sure how big the, this dispute is here. I, I, a lot of what you just said I, I agree with, but it seems to me the key is what <coughs> we mean by being in the manifest image or in the same. So obviously the fact that we're talking about a state of a manifest perceiver doesn't make it a manifest image issue we're talking about. No. Obviously the fact that we're explaining something that goes on in the manifest image doesn't mean that we're doing manifest image work. Uh, the difference I take it is that the manifest image we're, we're is, is a, a practice of perceiving the world for the practical concerns we have in ordinary life and the ep epistemic assessments we make of each other in the ordinary course of things and assignments of social, yeah, all of that. The scientific image is defined by the fact that it's giving systematic, theoretical, uh, uh, a theoretical entity positing explanations for how all of that and other stuff goes on. And it seems to me then, once you make the distinction that way, that the, that the conflict can only arise when you're doing that second thing. There's no incompatibility between saying, I've got a state that is in some sense a blue perceiving when I both see the blue bottle and hallucinate the bottle, and there's a blue bottle, there's no contradiction there. The problem arises when I try to give a, 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 a detailed <coughs> theoretical account of how there could be a critter that tracks those sorts of things in the world, right? Not an epistemological story. It's the causal story of how you get... So when, So precisely when those states that Jones talks about become theoretical posits and we start reflecting on what kind of posit they are and how they relate to properties of the object but that's by definition like that's the very definition of what a scientific image issue is so it's when the scientific image starts trying to give the underlying uh, engineering story of how these critters work these manifest image inhabiting critters work that we get that there's a problem maintaining two of the things those manifest image critters have in them. So it's it, it that so to me that I took it that to be Jim's original point that only because the scientific image is coming to grapple theoretically with the manifest image do we start getting a contradiction. If we were just happy to play football and cook and talk to one another and make sense of, you know, knowing that the, the blue water bottle that we need for dinner is in the kitchen, there's no tensions yet. It's only when we try to theoretically come to grips with that. But that's, by definition, scientific image. May, may I? Yeah, well, I, I, I think there's, there's an important, important part um, of what you say. I, I agree, especially with the first part of what you said. Um, I, I just would draw different, different conclusions from that. Okay. Um, if we simply live in the manifest image, as it were, and we do not sort of, um, well, we do not reflect on it, then there can be no uh, theoretical pressure. As soon as we start reflecting on what we do in this image and what are the basic categories of this image, how do they hang together, what is, so, uh, as it were, I mean, we are doing a lot of explaining and explanation already within the manifest image, which right. is a very important point for the Smith. Uh, depends on what kind of explaining you need to do. Yeah, yeah, I think it's to do with the form of the explanation. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. even if... Yeah, uh, but it's well, it's my, my, my point is... It's positing theoretical that entities. I don't see that like what John says. But that's the first step of the scientific image. Be by definition, he postulated an entity. Yeah. But, no, that's also, that's not but that's also no. built into the manifesto. That is not that simple no. because... No. He's, no. He's, uh, he's, he's positing states of um, objects of, of, of the of objects which are the, the basic objects of the manifest image. So it, is a, it can be argued and said in parts, in part, uh, there are some parts that are very does that, 
which make quite clear that he takes this to be an, a development within the manifest image. Jones is not part of the scientific image simply by postulating no, no, states no. of he's postulating states of persons. He and that's all a mode of explanation that goes way back. That kind of pre scientific right. that will posit states yeah. to explain things. And exactly. Jones does that sort of thing. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. But yeah, no, no, that's that, 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 that,
motivated rational progression right. in reality and in cellar. So they're not, they're not just doing separated things. Okay. But the point is that the conflicts that I see in, in, in the things Johanna is talking about only happen when you have started making that rational shift. So when you're called, because I, 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 you know, maybe there's some other kind of reflection that doesn't bring in the norms of systematic science. But I don't see how reflection on the manifest image that isn't already acceding to the constitutive norms of theoretical science gets you the kind of contradiction that you think is there. It's only when you are driven to ask those kinds of specifically scientific questions about how all this shit works that you start seeing that it can't work the way the perennial philosophy thought it did. I, I would probably like to take up what, what, yeah. um, what, what Bill just said about perennial philosophy. I think perennial philosophy is not simply like yet another image, but it's like the reflective um, engagement with, uh, with, with the manifest image. And um, I think that well, probably uh, but this relates back to Jim's question as well. Oh, well, right. well right. 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 One could put it like, um, in a way, for Sellers, um, the sense impression um, introduction being something that happens within the manifest image, um, if those perennial philosophers would only have um, seen the full implications of the philosophical implications of this sense impression inference, then they wouldn't have <coughs> stuck to the manifest image in its Aristotelian form. So that's what I wanted to point out with this. And um, it, so in this sense, it might be important that the sense impressions in this introduction is real. It might be an important question whether the sense impression introduction really is an introduction within the manifest image. Because if you say, oh, that's already the scientific image, or it's already leading there, then of course you say, well, yeah, then you all have the wrong view already in place, and you have scientific realism already in place. And then, of course, what John said is, is, is completely valid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Matt is the way you really want to. Um, well, so I wanted to ask about this principle that something somehow a cube of pink in yeah. physical space is present in a perception other than is merely believed. Yeah. Um, I, I take it that that that, 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 the, that thought is crucial to the um, generation of the problem for the for the, the uh, uh, idea that physical objects have colors, and that it's important for your account uh, on, on, on on Johannes's account at any rate. Uh, um, for me, it's not a principle. For Bill, it's a principle. And and so I, I take it that that on, on your view that. Claim the, the the something somehow etc. Um, is uh, an articulation of something belonging to the manifest image or something like that, and it does it does look in this passage. You, I mean, I don't know these late Karras lectures, but the, um, in the passage you quote, he says one thing we can say with phenomenological assurances, and then he says more or less this yeah. principle. Uh, I would like to understand why he thought that that was a phenomenological fact. Uh, I know you're, you're just trying to describe what he thought, but I wonder yeah, whether you, well, could, yeah. you could speak for him here. Uh, I mean, uh, you, you might think, uh, you know, the, the adverbial theory of sensation is designed precisely to avoid the idea that when... I mean, I take, I take it... Sorry, sorry, let me see if I understand the principle. The principle says... Uh, if I have an experience as of uh, a pink cube in physical space, uh, then even if there is no pink cube in, in, in actual space here before me, nevertheless, there's something somehow a cube of pink in physical space. Right? Uh, but so, so I just let me get it out. Let me get out the question. And, 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 right, please. Um, well, uh, and I, I would have thought you could just uh, uh, once you have the idea of this adverbial approach to thinking about sensations in hand then in the case where there's there's no pink cube out there you do not say uh, there is something a cube of pink in physical space 
uh, right? You, you say rather, I am sensing pinkly cubically, whatever. I don't know. Uh, pink cubically. Right, pink cubically. Uh, pink Yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> for and, and so, and so, good, good. No, exactly. I mean, and so, and so, so, so it, if if that is a possible move, then it's not a necessary or it's not a phenomenological fact right? It's a further argument is required to, to, to get us to this principle so how could sellers of thought that, if that would be the principle uh, it would be the okay sorry so I've mis- misunderstood principle. the principle I mean I tried to, to separate this principle from the sense impression of right? yes. um, John didn't agree but that's what I tried to do mm-hmm. um, I said that those are two separate steps in a more complex reflection sense impression inference for me is uh, something that comes after or and is dependent in a way on what this principle says this principle is valid in, even if we radically see um, um, but focus on the IQ case focus on the case where we don't radically see does what does the principle mean in that case does it does it say does it say in the case where I have an experience as of a pink cube uh, but there is none in the in the you know out there. Uh, does it say that nevertheless there is something? That is not what the principle says. That, that is what follows from the principle by way of the sense impression inference, and together with certain other. Um, and so, what, how does the sense distinguishability and stuff like that? What's how the do, how does the sense impression it? inference go? I guess is what I want to know. How do we like it, in order for it to be a, a pa- fact of the manifest mm-hmm. image that. Uh, two things are in the very same sense pink Mm -hmm. on the one hand a a sensing and on the other hand a cube Um, we need to make it out that you know it it is through reflection on phenomenology that that none of us will dispute that we arrive at that not through some other explanatory enterprise Mm. right and I, so I was thinking that you had a strong case if, if this principle meant what I was taking it to mean. You had a strong case that Sellers thought it was phenomenologically obvious mm-hmm. at, at this late stage in his career. Mm-hmm. That if it doesn't mean that, then, then I want to know, well, how do, we, how do we get while remaining within the manifest image? And also, what phenomenological datum is the phenomenological? Right. What, what is it stating exactly? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, in, 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 in first instance, what he, what, what I think for him, get well. Um, let me try. I mean, uh, yeah. I'm not really sure whether it's a more feasible with what you wanted to, to do. Um, because I, I, I still think in, in the way you, you posed the questions, it, it, it somehow got, got mixed with this other aspect of, of what he took to be somehow phenomenological too, but it's not only that. Um, he, maybe I turn to that first. Because he says very clearly, um, phenomen- phenomenology uh, ends his then it reaches the end of its tether. It's tether, yeah, it's something like that. Yeah. Here's the, here we reach the end of the, the phenomenological tether, or something like that. I, I don't know, or something like that. I, very strange, but, but okay, phenomenological. <laughs> it doesn't lead us there. Yeah, and only <coughs> after that comes the sense impression inference. But before that, very clearly, we have this principle, this sentence, this what he took to be a phenomenological fact. And not just phenomenological, he also says phenomenology or conceptual analysis or and conceptual analysis yeah. lead us to this. He, he, to he this, doesn't yeah. distinguish yeah. between the phenomenology and the conceptual analysis here, for whatever and, that and means. And what does it, what does it mean? It's just that what there's is an actual case of redness in the non-vertical case. He uses the term actual and redness. But, uh, and he wants yeah. to say that if you're hallucinating vividly a red, a pink cube, there's pinkness yeah. actually existing and not just believed. Or, or well, that is where I would think that um, even in this, um, I, I really would try to, 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 to separate. I mean, there, there has to be this actual case of pinkness in, for him, in um, the somehow presence of red other than as merely believed, in, um, even in the veridical case. So and, and he's starting from the veridical case, and very clearly from the veridical case. And... Um, um, the, the thing here is really a, why, why he takes this to be a phenomenological fact that in our experience of the object, there is this pinkness is there other than as merely believed in. 
Mm -hmm. It has, doesn't have merely um, the, the structure of like a, a propositional content or something like that. It, there's mm -hmm. more to it. And this sense is, content. There is a sense component which you is somehow have mm -hmm. phenomenologically to acknowledge and philosophically to explain. That is what this principle um, is supposed to, to do. I, but I but the principle is in that sense just a challenge. To, we're going to yeah. look at it. We have a conversation between Matt and your yeah, so really like right to right to and Stephanie is going next, and Michael and Bill, and I think you have a different point. Okay, mm. yeah, okay well, I, I just, I just want to, I mean, yeah. I, I, I don't find the phenomenology obvious, I guess, so I would, maybe I want you to talk to me about that. I mean, the, the, I, I grant this, uh, that when uh, I uh, have an impression of something pink, yeah. that I sense pinkly, uh, I don't grant that no matter what is happening, whether there's something out there that's pink or not, uh, when I uh, sense pinkly, there is something pink. The principle sounds like it says there is something pink, and that, that would be the, the, that think, would be the wedge to drive me into a I problem with the second system. part. The second part is the sense impression inference part. That follows uh -huh. only if you take into account the sense impression inference. The first part is simply observation of what happens whenever we experience something. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's something else there. It's not merely intentional content uh, as, as conceptual content, something like that. Well, but I, I can see that in saying sense pinkly. I, t I take it. I yeah. mean, I, 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 that, that's not believing. Um, it isn't. No. Right? But there's uh, something like believing to be there. The like phrase something it. else could just mean some capacity other than the capacity of thought is engaged here, something like that. Well, something else yeah. can, 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 can have very little ontological, ontological import. It yeah. can just be a description yeah. of capacity. This or it can be like, yeah. there is something which is the object of the exercise of that capacity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is a sense thing, yeah. um, and, and then and Matt's point is that um, once we take the phrase something to be something we're quantifying over in that way, as the object of the sense, is that just phenomenology? No, and and no, I take it you're reporting. saying no. That's the sense impression. Of yeah, that's to I which think I think Matt's response is then the initial should be the initial description of the phenomenological datum is very misleading. Then. And it doesn't justify the sense datum inference, I guess. So it repudiates you know. the sense datum inference. No, in EPS. the sense impression inference. Sorry, sorry. But they're not the same because they, they are not the same. You don't, same. you don't get the same, you don't get in the very same sense of pink as much as you I think there's no description about that. Stephanie has been waiting a long time. I think I wanted to talk about the same thing, but now I'm a little bit confused because of the discussion. I just thought that. If one agrees that whenever one perceives or ostensibly perceives, I don't know, a cube of pink, then something is present other than merely believed in, one can agree to this without agreeing to saying that there's, that redness has actual existence. Mm -hmm. I thought that's... That is my point. And yeah. 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 And, uh, and, but I, and not, but I'm just confused. What's now the... The point was that um, how, how far do the ontological implications of this phenomenological, alleged phenomenological fact go? And, and that was not something I disagree with. I mean, there's a stronger and a weaker reading. And I simply wanted to emphasize that I think that at that point one could be happy with the weaker reading. And one doesn't have to invoke the stronger reading. But I'm, 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 uh, maybe I'm confused as well. But, 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 but I think the question we've arrived at now pushed by Stephanie and Matt, as I understand this. Let's, let's just take for a moment the weaker reading of what the phenomenological datum is. The phenomenological datum is just that sensibility is somehow engaged as a capacity there, even when I hallucinate. Mm. Um, the mere phenomenological datum itself does not give me a red thing sense, an actual red thing. <laughs> then you say, that's the work, I agree, that's the work of the sense impression inference. But now I take it, the question is, how does the sense impression inference work on the phenomenological data? I mean, um, if we describe the phenomenological data that thinly, in the way Matt's encouraging, how is it, um, you know, it plus what yields the sense impression inference? Or is it alone, just through reflection, um, supposed to um, 
as it were, um, entail the conclusion of the sense impression inference. I take it that's the question, Matt. Pressing the, so it's not yeah. just a doctrinal question of how does the terminology work? What's called the data? What's called an inference? Yeah. The question is how do they engage each other as, um, as one being a reason for that? I am, I am I'm happy with um, this question. I, I just don't n know more to say about it than status is about and that's really, really very little. Um, he simply, he took this very much for granted. He says, okay, that, that's what goes throughout his work. And I think that is a weak point. I emphasize this in the paper too. But I cannot give you any, any, any better explanation. But the, these, guys all think, these guys all think that the, it goes by a, you know, attempt at, uh, you know, giving a scientific explanation of the Commonality between the sensing pinkly and the the, the sensing no, something pink. I don't think that the, no, no, no. Aristotle doesn't do that. Yeah. Sorry, no, but I, I thought that I thought the, those con guys the contradiction arises only when you try to do that. That's not like that's right. right. Well, that, Sir, imagine people. It doesn't no, arise. You're it's it's a difference between contradiction and aporia. It's completely agreed all around here that what you're calling the sense impression inference is what Sellers calls the sense impression inference. Um, a label is introduced in science and metaphysics um, for an inference that he was already mm. pushing in EPM. Mm. Uh, and here's a claim that I think leaves this thing about something in some way read present other, otherwise than is believed in completely yeah. out. We don't need it. Think of, of EPM. Uh, um, in order to Mix a slight mix of EPM and science and metaphysics. I don't want to be able to give me an <laughs> evil eye, <laughs> right? Um, minimal conceptual episodes. Uh, um, um, part, uh, part, there's a kind partially describable, um, either seeing or ostensibly seeing, mm. an instance of red. Mm. The sense impression inference in those works is to the conclusion that there must be a kind of sense impression common to all such minimal conceptual episodes. Um, uh, and there's even some stuff in there, uh, in EPM already, about how to think about these mm. sense impressions, um, sensations, um, they, the sensations of color. Uh, um, are related to one another in ways that are interestingly mm -hmm. uh, structurally similar to colors, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? So um, that's a kind of first mm -hmm. move into understanding the mm -hmm. properties of mm -hmm. sensations of color. Uh, we haven't even yet got to uh, uh, two kinds of presence of red, presence to, to, to sense, yeah. presence mm -hmm. to thought. So that's just putting in. A, 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 the sense impression inference. Yeah. You're using it as a label for uh, the thing that that uh, goes beyond presence to yeah. sense. Um, starts from presence to sense is a fact we're stuck with, um, um, and needs we we need to uh, fix up how we're thinking about presence. That the things that are present to thought in order to make sense of how. Or, or to, to change, anyway, to understand mm. that this problematic setup. I think my my, my, I think my no, no. Yeah, go on. Uh, to, no. I, yeah, it's just, it, it, I, 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 I don't want everybody to agree about what the sense impression inference per se is. I think it's a. He's finished talking about it mm. long before he gets to uh, the rigmarole something in some way, blah, 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 is present otherwise than as believed mm -hmm. in. Uh, the ontologizing mm -hmm. move, as mm -hmm. you, as you just it. Uh, And, you know, the, the adverbial account of how to talk about sensations would be just fine. Um, what do you mean, redly, when you say sensing redly? Well, I mean um, uh, a mode of sensing that stands to sensing greenly, blah, 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 mm -hmm. in ways that are interestingly analogous to the ways in which um, what it is to be red stands to what it is to be green. Uh, and all of that's perfectly comfortable. Yeah. No, no uh, uh, problem that requires us to um, remove redness from okay. seeing things. Okay. meant to be mad. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that I, I, I would read the, um, the 
the way Stellas is exposing the argument in, in CPM differently. I mean, the difference between being for, for, for thought and being for sentence is there is only as the end of the first paragraph, at least, as a conceptual option. And um, well, the first section, not, not part of yeah, that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. If all it means is, is um, sensation of red is a perfectly okay label for a kind of sensation. Uh, and and you know, then we have to go on and say, um, be careful about this whole. Mm. It doesn't. It, it isn't to be lined up with, you know, thought of a celestial city or etc. Et um, it's not an old, mm. uh, an intention, mm. Mm. intentionality. But, in but that, uh, yeah. I I think though it already is in the first. The pheno- he says the phenomenological point is you know he says. Um, in that first uh, Karis lecture, we can say with phenomenological ins- assurance that whatever its true categorical status, whether it's manner of sensing or sense datum or constituent of a physical object, the expanse of red involved in an ostensible seeing of the very redness of an apple has actual existence as contrasted with intentional inexistence mm-hmm. as believed in. But And then... So I think he's already committed to things in the very in way he describes the initial phenomenological data that would others would resist, mm. say a disjunctive mm. view uh, no, well, would I resist. That, uh, I think that a disjunctive view is compatible in a way, but that's different. Uh, c- could I just come back to, to this um, EPM stuff? Because, I mean, the, the more important point about EPM and the development there, I think, is he's already talking there, uh, uh, I might help with some of the other questions, uh, is that he, uh, when he starts about descriptive core, of course, the content is probably his, his yeah. there. common descriptive content. He's yeah. talking about descriptive content there and later on about descriptive core. And, and mm-hmm. I take it that the descriptive core and descriptive content is aiming at the very same thing. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. I would like. What, to right? what is this? Thing? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. But I think that, the, that mm-hmm. I, I think that the phenomenon what he formally there is as the terminological fact that is something somehow um, reference is meant to capture that, just that, and nothing more. I take that this is everything he wants to say at this point, <coughs> what he thinks would be a phenomenological fact. That's why I think it's a very weak claim, and that's why I think the sense impressions inference later on is really doing the work here, and not the something somehow. I you see exactly the other way around from the way Jonas yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I, well, I would like to, to, Can uh, I just I add to bring this out. Yeah, Can I just add a remark about EPM, though, Johannes? Because I think he, it does seem to be quite tightly constrained. That John brought up what I wanted for, also want to bring up that phrase common descriptive content first comes up at the end of discussion of the logic of looks right when there's something missed out Um, but as far as EPM goes um, what's missed out is something that might be called the intrinsic character of these episodes in other words when, when notion of sensation is first introduced it's introduced relationally as state typically but not invariably brought about by confrontation with such and such an object and that's purely relational so then after the theory of analogical predicates is brought in as John points out these states of perceiving redly greenly and so forth have inferential relations which mirror those of red green as applied to objects he seems to say so far as EPM goes that answers the question of, intrins- of intrinsic content. There's nothing more... As far as EPM goes, he seems to think there's nothing more to say about it. Ex- the, the adverbial theory has got it. Analogical predicates have got you the intrinsic rather than the merely relational, which the initial account of sensations gave you. So there's not much in EPM that invites a, a, a more loaded gloss. I mean, just from the structure of the argument in EPM. The... Adverbial characterization serves to describe states of persons. So that's very free, I think. Yeah. Okay. But so it satisfies the intrinsic versus relational because absolutely. The, the, yeah. so because so they have so their why, own. Why, why, why is this? Where, 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 where's the point of disagreement here? I, I really don't get why I cannot simply say, yeah, that is right. Why do I need more? There's the laid and the, the, the loaded view that I am advancing. What, what would be the load of you? Uh, well, I think all Matt was saying, and John was echoing, is that so far as the account of intrinsic, so far as the solution of the, what's the intrinsic property 
problem goes in EPM. There's nothing that makes the ontologizing move to quote something that, that the phenomenological oh. datum oh, but, 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 uh, must be read a certain way and a very strong way to, but, but, to mediate. But sensual states and the invocation uh, of invoking of, of um, sen sen sensible states and sensible states and sense impressions um, is an ontological move and it's already there in EPM. But why should that not be an ontological move? And why would I need more? There's well, nothing in EPM that, that well, um, yes, corresponds well, to the thing that Jim yes. quoted out of the first lecture. Oh, the, 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 the actual... The, 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 oh, the expense okay. of red okay. is actual. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. There's okay. nothing in EPM that corresponds to that. Well, if you know, <laughs> there is the funny well, passage where he looks forward to these curious states, yeah. which will be yeah. the truth. So, so yeah. Johannes is right about this. Yeah. There's an odd promissory note in EPM, which yeah. comes like a bit of a bolt from the blue. Right. That when we put these things on the gold yeah, no, no not what he talks yeah. about what, <coughs> what the successor of sense datum sense yeah, will be. Yeah, that's right. Yes, yeah. I agree, that's yeah. already yeah. decided. No, that's absolutely but right. That's the scientific image. Why, 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 right. no, no, no. why should that be the scientific image? No, not, no, not. Mark, off it's 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 so, you're so so you, 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 you you me saying that you have a third image, and I, fair enough. Yeah. But it uh, seems uh, to me that. I'm happy if you would like to have a third one. Well, we all agree that. There's a certain amount of argument in EPM that requires you to tell some kind of a story about an important similarity between the cases where I hallucinate and see. And there's and, and, and we've got this possible analogic, uh, sorry, uh, uh, adverbial story or some kind of structural analog story or 57 <coughs> other examples we know from cognitive science. Mm -hmm. Some ki we also, I think, all agree that some kind of extra explanatory demand mm -hmm. is what's going to get us from that to pressure to invoke the stronger ontological notion, right? Uh, some kind, you, you have to have some kind of sense that that's not fully explained yet, that we need some other kind of... Now, and, and we're all saying, well, if you inserted the explanatory demands of having a full-on scientific theory of how these critters work, you'd get it. And you say, well, you don't need that. You need this thing, this philosophical explanation that the perennial philosophy got wrong. So my claim is that you do think there's a fairly autonomous thing called philosophical explanation that places extra demands, different ones from the scientific image, because mm. these things are all defined by functionally by what demands they place. Uh, you believe there's such a thing as philosophical explanation that's relatively autonomous in placing substantive demands and getting us substantive big, big ass conclusions. Mm. Why doesn't that just refute what Seller says in philosophy in the scientific image of man about what philosophy is? Um. It is not Namely, that it isn't that. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Very helpful, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I, well, I, I mean, I take, that, I take no. him really seriously there, that philosophy is just giving us the synoptic vision of how everything hangs together, and the only <coughs> real projects that need to hang together, you know, big picture, the exhaustive set of big picture projects at the end of the day, or the manifest image no. of the scientific image, you want a third thing. No, I mean, well, what I think is... Um, has to give a picture of the things has of how things have together which is consistent. And yeah. that is not what is um, there after the sense of uh, the sensors have introduced by Jones. That that is my claim. So I do not think that there's like extra I mean the the, the grounds for this philosophical reflection are, are all there in the manifest image and about in, in how we have to think about it. Why why is that why is that something external in a... Because I don't see why the, as far as the demands of the manifest image places, why the adverbial theory isn't perfectly good. I think that, um, well... For I just don't see any argument. Yeah, I think that there is two things for proponents. I think that the value theory um, is making an ontological point, not, not merely an whatever else point. And... Um, it is a way of describing those states of perceivers which have been introduced by Jones in the adequate way, in the way adequate to Jones' own theory of those, um, of those uh, states. And um, what the evolutive theory says, 
sense, from, from my point of view, is, among other things, that um, there are those corresponding properties of mental states which are systematically <coughs> dependent in their manifold upon what we take to be properties of objects, of physical objects. And um, so that is the ontological point that I think was already strong enough to say, from a Stalinism point of view, to, to commit us to say that there are really those states, and those states really do have those properties. I just properties didn't get that. It, that just sounded like a re total red herring there, that last step. What? A total? Red herring. Uh, <laughs> a, a non sequitur, the, the last step. Why, why? Why, should, why should the fact that I have a state that systematically tracks color changes imply that I have blue in my head. I just, it just well, this is like what he calls the... the, the unless you have a... Well, this is what he completely... Uh, I mean, like this in calling um, um, a transcategorial inference. But, but that in... Uh, the, the, the version of that inference that I understand, I don't endorse it, but yeah. the version that I understand <laughs> is the version that comes in in the Keras lectures where it's clearly bringing in all sorts of considerations about the way the structure of Finnish science has to go. I don't under even have a clue as to how anyone could think that you could make that inference without any of that stuff. It just seems you just want to say no. <coughs> don't so move. Let, let well, uh, try again. I think from, from my point of view, he, he, he does there. He starts with um, introducing self impressions, and then he has to say something about their qualities. And he says, well, okay, those qualities are qualities that resemble and differ in the relevant way from the qualities, sensible qualities of physical objects. Um, and he says, they, to do this, they must have qualities which are qualities of state and, and are substantial, as it were, and probably. And, um, and, and, and he insists that it's the very same properties transposed, as he, as he says, into another key. Yeah. That is from my point of view, a rather strong ontological claim. And I do not see how this is not an ontological claim and not a rather strong ontological claim. So like why is like not, if those same properties are transposed into this other ontological key, then, for him, I think, and that's what, at least what he says, maybe it's a bad argument, um, it follows that nothing in the world could have those very same properties. And that is... Mark, let me just say, that is what, what, what is there? That is not a red herring or anything. Or maybe it's a non-sequitur or an on, on, on Sarah's uh, view. Maybe I'm not bringing out the essentials of it clear enough, but that is simply... I, I don't think one can dispute this kind of reasoning being there. Maybe it's a bad reason, but it's not something that he didn't intend to say or said somehow, or it, it could be read like that. I guess I, I think, because it seems like... So here's an, here's an analogy. I was at a play which was designed to be... Uh, observed by deaf people and they sometimes had music going on and they did this very cool thing of translating the music isomorphically into visual images so you had different colors corresponding to different instrumental t instruments you had heights corresponding to tone you had volume you had, you, you, basically you had an isomorphic visual structure to the sound structure mm. it certainly doesn't follow that there were sounds on the wall Right. Uh, so my question, it, it sounds like this inference is just like that. You've got an, a, a structure, you've got a structure, some kind of structural isomorphism, therefore you have the same thing. And I agree with you that Sellers sort of makes that inference, but Charity, to my mind, says what he's got in mind there is the demands of making, making an account, uh, 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 of an account for this, where he gives these later arguments. He's not just thinking that automatically follows, sort of directly. He, he, it's because he's got these extra explanatory demands of how the science would work out that he thinks he can make that inference. And then, and that's why that passage Jim points to looks so much like a promissory note. He's saying we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna develop this in the full story, but the full story is gonna bring in the science. The full story does bring in the science, <coughs> but for my argument, the full story is not yet needed. Okay. And that, that is what, what I only want to claim. Of course, for him, the full story involves science. It has to. Um, that follows from what I try to, to, to line out here. And um, let me just 
say this. Um, for instance, he very often um, argues that way without so much as in alluding to science, even by way of, well, I don't know, application or something like that. You know. he sees, don't, he's doing no, no, we're doing mere phenomenology with a certain odd kind of explana- explanation. Yeah. That's the two ingredients mm-hmm. which seem to suffice for him. And um, I, I think that in in his well in his in his um, in the intermediate view we arrive at after this happens before we develop the full picture and venture further into the scientific image and, and say something about what has to happen there then I mean, he has his own story about that and so on and so on. This is not sensitive so far. Um, um, he really is quite uh, he says things like I mean this is the whole stuff about mistaking where he says what is in point of fact um, in your picture the um, colors on the on the wall pictures on the wall mm-hmm. um, what is in point of fact this picture of the wall is what we take to be a new picture a new analogy the sounds out there what we take to be the sounds out there yeah. that is that is not, that is a, he's not saying that that is what 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 is what is what ultimately he is committed to say mm-hmm. and he's absolutely uh, crystally clear about that point he is less clear about and that, of course, is the interesting story of what leads him to that point, and there are maybe steps in the argument which one wouldn't want to share. Mm-hmm. But it is not um, something... We, 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 and this result, this mistaking, is a philosophical description of what we do in the manifest image in its mm-hmm. innocent version. Well, we take to be there those... Um, um, colors of objects, but no, 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 they are not there, and um, we are mistaking what are in fact qualities of states of persons to be properties of physical objects. Bill, did you still? No, I've lost my uh, train of thoughts. Well, I I just wanted to summarize the situations. I understand. I mean, so maybe you're granting that there's a bad inference here, but so in order for there to be a a tension in the manifest image. Mm. Uh, the manifest image has to be committed to the claim that uh, both cubes uh, out there in space and sense sensations in the very same sense are pink, right? That that would be the that would be the tension. Mm. Would be would be the, the uh, claim that pink operates unequivocally mm. across these two contexts. Now, it sounded to me like. You were supposing that when Jones introduces an ontology of sensations, he's already, that's already tantamount to this. That, that seems wrong. It, it seems that there's a, there's a difference between introducing an ontology of sensations. We might do it in the following way. Uh, we recognize uh, uh, a similarity between the case where the pink cube is there and the case where the pink cube isn't. Uh, we say, well, in both cases, I was sensing pinkly and then we introduce the term a sensation of pink uh-huh. right which we stipulate uh-huh. just to be uh, what is present both in the case where I sense pinkly and there's no cube and the case in which I sense pinkly and there is a cube so far the of pink in sensation of pink has not been made out to be uh, pink in the very same sense that the cube mm-hmm. is pink. The crucial thing for your mm-hmm. tension in the manifest image is the unequivocality Mm-mm. claim. No, no that's um, wrong. It isn't, yeah. Bill, would you like to? Okay. I mean, I mean, it's introduced, it's introduced analogously, right? So there's, there's an analogy. The, the, the idea is no, that... No, I, I like that. That's, that's, right, that's Seller's yeah. view as I understand it, no, but that right. doesn't generate a tension in the manifest Why image. Hold it. Well, well... well I, I mean, this this one something, something I, that bothered me earlier. Mark kept looking, kept kept looking for the contradiction when Johannes was talking about an aporia. But those are different things. The contradictions can give rise to aporia, but aporia simply are things, as I understand, that you can't answer. Right? They're questions that you don't know sort of how to go on about. 
they're not necessarily contradictions. So, why does, uh, so, so the question is, so, so, let, me, let me finish. <laughs> um, so um, the idea is that, is that the, the, in the manifest image, there are questions that can be raised that it is not capable of answering. This is very much, you know, in, in the uh, mode, it seems to me, of Kant's, you know, assertion that reason itself poses questions that it is not able to answer. Same kind of, uh, of thing that poses questions, and, and it, it's looking for a kind of explanatory closure, a kind of completeness to it, that um, extend its principles um, however it will, and that means allowing, for instance, um, that dimension of discourse which is already there in Nuce uh, at the beginning of the manifest image and flowers into science, allowing that to flourish and to go on and it, it will find that down its own resources um, it's not going to be able to answer some of the questions that it, it enables us to raise. That's the aporia that he needs. He doesn't need a contradiction anywhere. Is that all you meant, Johannes? Because if that's all you meant, then we don't disagree at all. Of course there are questions you can't answer in the manifest image, namely all the scientific questions. And they arise because of there's these things we want a scientific theory of them. No, I think the thought here is that the manifest of it encounters questions yeah, within the sure. manifest image yeah. that it cannot answer sure. within the manifest image. Yeah, you're sitting there, you say, wow, how could we systematically be like this in doing these things? That's a that's great the, question. That can I mean, that's, one, one, not, that's not the aporia. I'm, I'm, yeah. I, I, I think Matt's way of putting it. Um, why isn't it a comfortable stance for a manifest image? Uh, and this is a reflective mm-hmm. occupant, right? So, so Aristotelian philosopher let it be. Um, it, it's enough to say about uh, these uh, sensations of color that the sense impression says we have to accept uh, that they are sensations of, e.g., red. Um, uh, uh, you could say more than that. You can say. Uh, there are properties of these sensations got at by calling them of red, etc., uh, that, that uh, are to be understood analogically from perfectly familiar properties of visible things, red, etc. Um, uh, the, 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 the Johannes is the shape. You're quite right. It's not a contradiction. It's got to be. Um, no, that won't. What well, that won't do, right? More mm-hmm. needs to be. I'm said not happy with that. Yes. Uh, uh, right. um, I can't rest from from the yeah. by the lights of the manifest image itself. The reflective manifest image philosopher. Um, that, that's no good. Oh. We have to go further. Why? Why isn't it? Why isn't that enough of a story? Yeah. And, and um, now we do get a response. Um, well, look, because um, uh, the, these. Um, supposed understandings of kinds of sensations uh, introduce uh, these items, uh, expanses of red that are actual, only um, not there to be seen, right? Um, and, 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 and now um, uh, it can't be the property that those expanses of red have uh, that uh, any actual expanses out there, and I mean that's the, sh- the shape of it. But it all hangs on um, the, the, the setup as Matt's describing it: adverbial theory of sensation. And if you want to decorate it by saying, um, understand the adverbs analogically from properties of visible things, um, it, it hangs on saying that is not a comfortable stopping point. Um, yeah. Um, I think so. And, but one of the reasons it's not comfortable, would you agree with this, is already in back in EPM, he considers well, various al- alternatives. Scientific. <laughs> but the alternatives he considers are things like this, uh, a definite description view of the interstate. There is something that it, it gives a uh, topic neutral <coughs> description of the interstate. Michael mentioned that he thinks it's purely structural, mm-hmm. and he explicitly considers that and rejects yeah. it at the end of EPM. So it's already in EPM, he's got a stronger idea about the intrinsic content that has to be preserved, that just saying you're sensing readily. But the, 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 the analogical, the idea of analogical extensions of understandings, um, as far as EPM goes, it looks to me as if that's satisfactory to him. Um, um, Right, the, the, the mere definite description thing, no good. Right. Where well, you're just exploiting the concept of a property of visible things. Um, but but um, I, I mean, EPM is 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 larded with um, 
uh, urgings of us to take very seriously the powers of analogical. Well, but, 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 but when you ask, you know, that, are they satisfactory? Is, is, the, is the analogical understanding of color is satisfactory? Then you have to ask, satisfactory for what? And you want to say, well, because he's already got these scientific prejudices. And it's not clear to me that that's the right answer. The question is whether Johannes is right that, that there is some unsatisfactoriness. Mm-hmm. Um, right, uh, well, palpable by the lights of the reflective uh, um, occupant of the manifest image, the philosopher of the manifest image. Uh, that, that's where we've been all along. It seems like the deeper, purely exegetical issue here is, is one that can be raised racketing one's issues about scientism. That is, one could think, one could, one could be, as it were, one could think there's nothing scientific about Sellers at all. You know, the, his picture of the scientific image is great, and so on and so forth. But, but there's still a question about um, what explanatory demands, um, to what extent the explanatory demands that lead us to be dissatisfied with the account John was just telling whether they have their origin, you know, in you know a form of reflection that cannot stop with the analogical account, account of the manifest image, or whether it's the legitimate demands of of scientific theorizing that lead us to not rest there. I mean, it's, you know, it seems like the issue of scientism completely can completely be bracketed here, and there's still an exegetical question about right. you know, yeah, absolutely what, so, what, what causes the discomfort that allows well, us not think, to be able to rest here. Do you think this year might be what it is? I mean, it shouldn't be, but isn't it, Bill? I mean, or Johannes, I mean. I mean, on the face of it, the adverbial theory is supposed to help you out by getting rid of any kind of act-object structure mm-hmm. in the awareness involved in the non-veridical case. There is no expanse of red or red object or anything there. There's only a state which you're in in both cases, but which has analogical relations uh, as part of its internal right. character, modeled on the interrelations between visible colors of objects is the thought that you can't really believe that because there's something in the experience and which the classic sense datum theorist wanted to say I mean, that invites a kind of act-object understanding even though the, the adverbial theory <coughs> is supposed to get rid of that. But you, you, can't, a paper on you, this, you right? can't quite believe it because there's a tendency to say no, redness is present in a way that in something like the way in which the redness of the object is present. In other words, is the thought that you just can't really believe the adverbial theory on phenomenological well, grounds, I mean, if you're a manifest image person? But, but look, I mean, Sellers has because a Because that doesn't bring science in at all. Um, it's called the adverbial theory of sensation. Yeah. Uh, surprise, surprise. Um, and, and as I recall, uh, I, I admit my memory sucks, so maybe I'm not right about this, but as I recall, the, ba- the basic point is that Look, uh, adverbial theory, sense impression stuff, it, it turns out that the vocabularies are so um, uh, systematically mappable onto each other, there's not really much of a difference. Um, so he doesn't think that, I mean, even though he used, for a number of papers, he uses the adverbial uh, form of uh, expression uh, pretty systematically and, and seems to prefer it, but in the end he sort of decides eh, it's not, it, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. But it has to, because the way, the, way sens- the way sensations are first introduced, there's a genuine of, but it's not intentional, it's a causal of. And, so, and that's genuinely relational. These are states that are typically, but not invariably. It is a purely ontological, not epistemological yeah. version of the sense that the theory yeah. tries to it. Um, yeah, look, the what is it's that Johannes has a paper written on Sellers. In the very, in the very right. last paper. And, and that's where he stands our sensings, for instance. I mean, that's where he does that to sort of bring those two together, of course. And then that helps them. Johannes, I'm just looking, is there some way in which you could feel in terms of, as it were, the, pheno- the structure as given phenomenologically that makes you think, even as a manifest image theorist, that going purely adverbial doesn't really get it. I mean, if, if he's got that, then you've got your argument, I think. Because then it's going to be, it's going to be independent of all this science stuff. If you can think that there's something, so to say, phenomenologically not credible about the adverbial theory being the bottom line. That there was something that the traditional sense data theorist was looking for 
that the adverbial theory doesn't capture because but broad broad says look the ovalness is there when you flip the penny <laughs> in a way that going adverbial isn't going to capture phenomenologically isn't going to capture mm. but because th- because there's a structure to the experience not just a content I mean, look, I don't know, I don't believe this, but it would, it would do the trick if you... He's trying to help you. Isn't it, isn't it, isn't it, isn't it clear that he got the adverbial theory, unlike post-1970s adverbialists, doesn't get rid of the problematic property, the way Stella Hughes uses the adverbial theory? EPM, it seems to. No, I don't think so. I did. If you look at the final section of EPM, you've got this intrinsic... Uh, content. You don't just have a. The analogical theory exactly. has to preserve the intrinsic content. It's recategorized yeah. as a. It is, and the but, intrinsic content is, uh, just but that's not the, 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 the differential that's, that's That just adds to the mm-hmm. sensation of stuff by giving predicates which are intrinsic characteristics of the states. Right. Uh, they have the same. They, they are inferential mirrors of color predicates as applies to objects. As far as EPM, as far as I can see, that's all he gets. That's all he gets you. Unless you think there's another into phenomenological intuition there driving it. I, I think he doesn't end with purely structural variance, inferential structure. He thinks what going adverbial does is get rid of the object um, and gives you a sensing, but the sensing still has the problematic property that he then goes on to his more you know, speculative theories to preserve. But the reason you have to preserve it is Sellers adverbialism doesn't do what a lot of adverbialists would like to do to, to, to sort of say the problematic pro- property isn't as problematic because it's not the property of an object. So he wants the adverbialist to solve one problem while he's connecting from the real, the real motivation for introducing it. <laughs> <laughs> I would think a lot of people think adverbialism will help you avoid what Sellers spends. But am I well, right? Can't get rid of that. Am I right? I mean, Johanna, you, you ha- have a moment in your paper, I can't find it, where, where you, you, you either you quote Sellers, you represent Sellers as saying, here's the problem. It's that nothing that's a property of a state of mind can itself be a property of objects out there. That, that can only be a problem if the use of pink, yeah. say, is unequivocal between sensation of pink and pink cube. Right, uh, and uh, the, as the, for, for all that's been said about there needing to be intrinsic qualities of sensations, nothing has been said that establishes that in the very same sense of that's pinkness, right. the sensation has pinkness and the, um, the, the, the cube has pinkness. I mean, so, that's, so that's, I, I agree that there, would be, there would be a great problem in the manifest image if, if there were the following commitment in the manifest image. Uh, the sensations are pink, the cubes are pink, and here we talk about pink in the very same sense. Uh, the intrinsic uh, quality of the, of the cube of pink um, as um, experienced in our representation of the cube of pink is that to be, by the manifest image, to exist in the cube, in the pink cube out there. Yeah. And what Sellers now says is, and what he takes to be incompatible with that view is, um, <coughs> the intrinsic, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the sense impression is taking into account all there is to intrinsicality as with respect to sensibilia. There needs to, uh, cannot be said anything more. What we have to explain is how can there be those intrinsic properties in our experience of the object. And that's what we have explained, introduced by the sense impression inference and by transposing those very intrinsic properties into another category of key, as he puts it. So that, that's the point where he says, um, if you have understood what you have just done by, this, uh, by, by invoking sense impressions and by the way you ascribe them their properties, you cannot even ask anymore whether those objects out there still have those properties or something like that. Right. That was... But look, intrinsic can't, doesn't mean not inferentially articulated, right? I mean, I mean they're intrinsic in this... I mean, they're intrinsic in the sense that they're fully yeah. represented by monadic predicates, whereas the original notion of sensation of, which is causal, is, is dyadic. And mm. So when you've got pinkly, red, you know, they're intrinsic 
in the sense that they're just adverbial modifications of a state. Um, now, it doesn't mean non-relational in the sense that don't get their content from their place in a network of descriptions because everything gets its content that way according to Sellers. I mean, otherwise, we're going to end up back with the myth of the given. There's a kind of knowing what red is, which is, so to say, fully non-conceptual. And, now, and that would be... That, that route he can't go. Intrinsic is, a, is really a word that you have to read in the context of his broader inferentialism. I, mean, it I, can't I, I don't think that, I mean, it must have structure, but I don't think that the structure must be inferential, as it were. That, that is a bit uh, misleading because inferentialism seems to be, or inference seems to be um, attached to conceptual. No, all, all I meant was that the, the analogical predicates are, are introduced mm -hmm. uh, with relations to each other that, as John said, mirror the relations between the colors yeah, of, that is of, of yeah. visible objects. Yeah, and, but, but that does it for intrinsic. I mean, it, it's as intrinsic a property of the state as red is but of, the, of the object. But, I mean, but as, as Matt says, it, it, it's not an unequivocal use in the two cases. I mean, at least so far as... That doesn't EBF do it for intrinsic. That's not all he wants by intrinsic. I mean, that does, is part of it, and it needs to have this part to really mirror um, the properties, the sensible properties of objects, but that's not all there is to the sensible properties of objects and by way well, of analogy to the sensible properties. Well, now I'm worrying well, about the myth of the given. Now I'm worrying about the Now it only shouldn't <laughs> since that we never take those sensations to be just that. We take them to be objects of properties. So they are embedded in a rich conceptual, conceptual framework which is um, the manifest image. They are only in abstraction later on um, accessible to us um, and uh, um, as properties of mental state. So that nothing uh, to worry about here. <laughs> not in terms of the myth of the given. Maybe much to worry about, but not in terms of the myth of the given. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have Two questions. One of them is actually related to the topic that hasn't been discussed yet, and that's the relationship between Sellers and Kant. But, but just to stay on that topic for one second, I mean, I wonder how, on your account, this aphoria is related to the later claim from science and metaphysics that you introduced to work, the end of the the end of the future. Mm -hmm. um, so here it seems to me when you sort of elaborate on yeah. So I was claiming that um, there is the, the, the idea of, of guidedness, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. So here you give us, you know, um, some notion of, you know, sort of reflection or self-consciousness even, mm -hmm. which is built into experience itself, into mm -hmm. perceptual optics that I take you to think are part of the manifest image itself and you sort of give us a reason to think that this self-consciousness that is internal to the manifest image is itself a reason <coughs> or it's an explanation of the ontological move and I just, but I'm not clear at all about the relation between this kind of this self-consciousness <coughs> and the kind of Reflection on the aphoria that we've been talking about. So, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So I mean, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't know if you think he needs both. Whether he needs both of them in order to, in order to justify the ontological move. Um, whether the, this this sort of felt guidedness is part of um, perceptual optics also in the case of, for example, perceptual optics of that are only and of things, but not of things, whether there is a sense of guidance. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, yeah, I don't know, I don't know how you think about them, how, how you think about the relationship between them. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, okay. Um, I think that um, the, the, the whole question of guidance, I mean, that's a really obscure topic, but um, <coughs> I, 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 I had to allude to it just to bring out um, 
connecting to, to the Khan paper here and to the, what I took to be a status statement of the mutual dependence of experience of objects and, and taking those experiences in a way to be the adequate of, of those very objects. Um, so, um, guidance really is a way of bringing out that transcendental constraint. Um, so there must always be, for sellers, um, some sort of guidance of our perception through the object, through an independent reality. Yeah. And the concept of guidance and the concept of an independent reality um, go, are connected quite closely um, in, in his thought. So um, what he, what he, the general structure in, in, in the argument was that given Sellers sees this development, uh, I, we did discuss well, most of the session, um, as, as, as something that really happens there. It really is uh, uh, happening and we have to somehow um, arrange this, uh, this um, internalization of the sense of the properties of objects. Then the, um, an important sense um, of, of, the, of the, the world loses our concept of an object of experience because without these objects of experience were partly constituted by exactly those um, sensible properties. So um, what I um, try to make plausible then is that uh, we cannot simply live this internal internalizing sort of all of reality in Sellers on Sellers account since um, this would um, give up this um, concept of an independent reality and uh, in the same, st the same token um, our us being guided to this um, independent reality in our perception. This independent reality accounts for the objectivity of our perception as the first um, the, the framework, the guidance as it were, provides the framework and um, so does the um, concept of an independent reality, the conception of objectivity, of objective reality. And um, this is the framework that has to hold across images. Whatever you do within your image, you cannot give that up. And that you cannot give that up has to do with the argument he ascribes to Kant in the Kant on Transcendental Idealism paper, which I'm trying to I, I, I took Karen's question to be how does the topic that comes up in that part of your paper relate to the discussion we've just had for almost two hours? I mean, I guess uh, I, I thought I, I thought I, I right, but 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 <laughs> well, you, well, I mean, you said something about how basic the second is, but but I mean, a, a question here would be something like: there's something called the sense impression inference in yeah. the field. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about what okay. motivates it. Um, there's something <laughs> called the transcendental sense impression inference in science and metaphysics, which, um, in the story you're telling, yeah. um, in order to have a conception of our world picture as um, as anchored, <laughs> as not leading to a bad kind of idealism, we might say, right. requires external constraints. So, so it's a certain kind of trans or reflection of the very credentials of any kind of knowledge mm -hmm. that um, it have this kind of con guidance. And the idea of a sense impression there is now being introduced as something that supplies that. So prima facie it looks like... Sense other impressions do not supply guidance. They bring out a problem for the conception of guidance, which has to be solved then. Okay. Uh, because the sense impressions, um, in a way, which I try to bring out in, in, in the paper, um, lead to the loss of the conception of object of experience as conceived in the manifest image. This is not stable, uh, uh, that, is, that is the important part. And since we cannot do without the concept of an object of experience, we have to uh, newly schematize our category of framework and to newly adjust um, to su supplement um, a new concept of an object of, object of experience, which then is an object of the scientific, of the scientific image, for whatever reason. I mean, there, there's a gap here between um, what is right now, we simply 
build up something else. I mean, science is, is something like um, what I take to be the, the, the rational um, way of, of, of um, providing explanations for um, phenomenal um, goings on. So, whatever fulfills that would be science. And um, I take it that this is part of what this objectivity um, claim would come to as well. So, science is sort of like an umbrella term for whatever. And we do that. It doesn't need to be very, in a natural sense, very closely conceived or something like that. But um, in fact, it does in fellows. But this, I think, it is, is due to his, well, the, the, his conviction about the natural sciences. That's very deep. And what you're saying here, I mean, has some of the earmarks of what people were asking for in the, the EPM discussion. That's what you're saying here. I, I, I follow it, is a kind of reflection that is independent of scientific theorizing from within the manifest image, in which we need a certain kind, through a certain kind of transcendental reflection, yeah. we come to a certain conclusion. Yeah. But then, and then the question is, do you want to see that kind of structure already in EPM? No. Okay, okay, I don't think I don't it's there it. either. But then, so then I those earmarks of how it solves the problem, you know. Yeah. I I don't so why do you need, I mean, basically, I mean, I mean, one suggestion would be maybe just focus on that, right? Why focus do you need on? just on, on that? Let's talk about science and metaphysics and not EPM to make his point. Oh, well, um, well, something like that, yeah. yeah. I, I, that, um, that was the point. In a way, I'm, I'm happy to do that, but um, I think the, 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 the pressure that ultimately leads to that is already there in EPM. Uh, that, that's a different, I mean, that, that is independent, but it has a certain and dimension. That's why I asked about the connection. I think that's How certain, that, yes. Yeah, yeah, that was just like, like yeah. what Jim said. But, but um, um, this doesn't have, I mean, that, uh, I, I... I was trying to ask her a question. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I am, no, I am, well, I tried to answer it. <laughs> No, the thing is, I, I really think that um, um, something important happens between APM and science and metaphysics, um, and, and be it only that Sellers became more clear about how his, um, uh, how what he did there, the, the, the various transcendental dimensions of what he did there came to his <coughs> consciousness in a way. I mean, he, he was much more open about that. I mean, he didn't uh, talk about at all in, 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 in EPM and, and um, it, it, he wasn't, I mean, that was claims to have done this for a very long time before and even having the basic <coughs> interpretation, but I'm not sure how how far he would have gone back then in saying, okay, and Kant was right here, yes. and um, I think this is gets even stronger, not in science and metaphysics, but in the late papers on Kant, uh, on imagination and on Idealism. Those two papers really bring out Sellers' Kantianism to the fullest. And uh, so, what I did was somehow back reading what he does there into um, and bringing this together with earlier stuff, but with later stuff as well. And uh, that is, in this sense, the more important dimension because I think um, the Kant papers clearly belong to the later period and um, they. Um, somehow should fit together with what he says there. And um, if not everything is there or in EPM, I'm, I'm, I'm happy, uh, at least as far as the transcendental stuff is concerned, I'm happy to acknowledge that. Um, I just think, still think I have different reading of, of the relevant sections of EPM. Um, so, and um, a reading that helps me to put this more in line with what's going on later on. For instance, I do not see um, that um, this new, this transcendental turn in, in science and metaphysics really um, affects those traits of EPM, namely the sense impression of friends and uh, what I take to be its implications. On that note, um, I have some announcements, but before I make them, shall we thank you? First, a really boring announcement, but I feel I better make it now in case there's someone who plans to leave now but not come back till Sunday. On Sunday, um, the only door of the library that will be open is the entrance that's to your right as you go out here, the east entrance. The other entrance to the library will be closed. So if you're planning on attending 
the workshop on Sunday, and we won't have a chance to talk to you before then. Be aware that you need to enter from that side if you want to get in, or otherwise you'll be standing out there, not being able to get in. Um, That's just for the just until 10 a.m. Just until 10 a.m. Okay, good. Thanks, Julie. Um, um, other announcements. Um, we will, um, second, there's three. The second announcement is we will con- reconvene at 2 o'clock with um, Steve Engstrom's session, and we will move, um, to, I, I anticipate, a discussion more focused on Todd than on Stella. So, um, <laughs> um, you never know with this group. <laughs> and um, the, the third announcement is those of you who are the primary participants who are invited to the conference, who are chairing or um, presenting papers and sessions, we've arranged some lunch for you right here. I'm afraid we don't have lunch for more than those people. I apologize for that. Um, there's lots of places to see in the neighborhood. Um, if you don't know your way around, you might want to follow someone who does, and we'll see you all at 2 o'clock. Thanks, John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which one has to be good? It has to be good. We need to bring our food back. We need to bring our food back. Because I take it, I know Michael. No, I was Yeah. 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 Yeah.